Hello, welcome to today's webinar on where's the impact Gen AI's business value and enterprise CX. We have three delightful guests joining us to discuss this today. Sheila, Alan and Sebastian, could I ask each of you to introduce yourselves, please? Sheila, starting with you. Absolutely. Thank you. My name is Sheila McGee Smith. I am an industry analyst and I have been covering the ACD to call center to contact center to CCAS market full time since 1990. So I've got some background here. Great to have you. Alan? Hi, uh, I'm Alan Ranger. I'm the head of marketing here at Cognity. Uh, I've been involved in the contact center space on and off since the early 1990s. In fact, starting in the ACD market, um, working on software, the first software ACDs, uh, and then going through companies like Nuance and LifePerson. And uh, I've spent the last year and a half at Cognity. And I have to say, it's probably been the most fun year of my life. There's been so much going on in the last 12 to 16 months, and it's certainly keeping me young and entertained. <laughs> Great to have you, Sebastian. Hi, I'm Sebastian. I run product marketing for Cognigy. Um, I'm also a technology evangelist. Um, and uh, as that, I work very closely with our R&D teams when it's about the latest and greatest AI technology. Um, but I also have the privilege to work closely with our customers and our partners and also with, with industry analysts to um, get a very good understanding of the use cases and the real life applications of the technology and where the AI driven world is going for our clients uh, in the future. Fantastic. Thank you for your introductions. Um, and I'm Jessica Gopalakrishnan. I'm Senior Director of Marketing at Cognigy and your moderator for today. So let's dive into some questions. To kick off the conversation, I think it's important to address the challenges associated with integrating generative AI solutions into enterprise CX strategies. What would you say are potential hurdles of implementing Gen AI into enterprise technologies? Sheila, can we start with you and then we'll go Alan and Sebastian. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we all have heard the term FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I think all three of those apply when we think about Gen AI, Gen AI right? Fear, what's the fear? You know, there have been some isolated issues. You know, recently there was an airline that had to honor a price that was misquoted by a bot. And that gets lots of attention and people sort of focus on that. What gets less attention are the millions of transactions that are automated flawlessly every day. What's the uncertainty part? You know, companies think, will my customers welcome automation? Will my agents welcome new agent assisted capabilities? You know, it's nice to say this other company had that, but they're different because everybody thinks that they are a unicorn, right? And then third, there's the doubt. Some companies don't believe the hype or believe so much that their company is different that again, they may believe that somebody else is getting it. They're just not sure that they will. Okay, yes, and I'd certainly build on that. In fact, I'll take it slightly the other way. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles is people believing the hype. So you've got, you know, the uh, the senior leadership of companies being told by the management consultants yeah. that they can reduce their operational costs by 30% just by using generative AI. And funnily enough, if you ask ChatGPT what it's good at, it says, I'm really good at customer service. And so there's this expectation level at the in the C-suite that you can just easily deploy generative AI in customer service and the magic is done. So I think there's an expectation gap because then the reality is very different and you just can't implement to that. You know, we all know that because, you know, we've been looking at this for the last year. Uh, I think the other um, sort of misconception as well is that Copilot has been jumped on by everybody as the generative AI answer and the generative solution. Uh, but it's taking it from the wrong angle. It's still the what we've been doing for 30 years with the CCAS vendors of let's make the humans more efficient. It, and I think really what we should be doing is thinking, let's make the humans lives better by taking away the things that we could automate. And I think it's now become, we're certainly seeing this in the market, that there's a distraction away from which are the high volume use cases that we can automate really well and really deliver a fantastic customer service have been replaced with, let's just make humans more efficient with Copilot in the background. 
Yeah, and a, and a lot of the hype to add to that is driven by a lot of vendor messaging out there. You know, if we scroll through our LinkedIn feeds, it's full of fantastic videos and ideas of use cases that may or may not be real. But of course, it, on the positive side, it inspires people of what could be possible with AI today. But uh, on the other hand, some of that is unrealistic and it's certainly not achievable in the first step. So when I talk to clients and prospects, many don't know where to start. They're almost, almost overwhelmed with the potential that AI brings to the table, and they have very particular practical problems. So Gen AI solves a lot of problems, but it creates a whole bunch of new exotic problems, right? What do we do with data security and privacy with, with large LLMs? Um, how do we mitigate hallucinations? That was not something that was heard of two years before in conversational AI. Uh, how do we find the right people to build a bot that is super knowledgeable and kind of self-driven Gen AI based, but it's also transactional that can do something. So there's a lot of practical problems to be tackled. And I think we're very early in the in the evolution to solve these problems and really see mass adoption in the contact center space. Really great points. So on the flip side, what are the opportunities? Let's start with uh, Alan on this and go Sheila, Sebastian. Yeah, sure. So um, I think we're getting to the point where the, the AI agents that are built using the, the combination of uh, conversational and generative AI will be so good, we can actually start looking at use cases outside of customer service. Um, in customer service, you need to have something done. So you'll put up a, with a certain amount of friction on your journey. You know, we tolerated the IVRs, we tolerated going on hold because we needed to get our broadband fixed so we could make that conference call, you know, in 10 minutes time. You know, there's all the things that when you want something fixed, you'll put up with a lot of nonsense and a lot of uh, bad service. But if you're buying something or somebody's marketing it to you and there's friction built into the, the conversation or it's just difficult to do, you're not going to do it. But I think with, you know, uh, AI agents that truly understand what your intent is, what your needs are, they perhaps even know you because they've got access to the back end CRM systems and they can genuinely help you with a purchase decision. I think that this now means that we will see really, really good AI agents that act as your sort of personal concierge in, in you know, sales and marketing environment and can really understand you and genuinely be your that personal assistant we've always been looking for. So, you know, again, with, with the history I have in this market, I look back and think of the many problems that have been solved with technology over the years. Uh, the transformation that has really been happening in the contact center on, on a constant basis. I remember when uh, a, a, na a nationwide department store would have different numbers for the billing department at every branch of the retail store. Or there was no easy way for a sales associate at a New York branch to know the status of items on a gift or bridal registry opened in the Connecticut branch, right? Or having to walk or get in a car or drive to get anything, right? Medical attention, financial advice, and to work in a contact center. So think of all of the technology changes that have impacted how customer experience has improved over the years. So just like past uh, technological improvements have helped, I think Gen AI promises a new generation of improvements, uh, faster agent training, right? Less time in the classroom, more time taking calls, um, more personalized service, right? The, the promise of personalized service has been around for a long time and we've made some baby steps. I think we're on the cusp of some really major steps and, and you know, pointing back to what Sebastian said about data. I think the focus on data that Gen AI brings is an important one and one that we really haven't um, nailed yet, right? And then fast, you know, interestingly, faster authentication. I mean, we all know, you know, calling into a bank, calling into a hospital, we're asked this series of questions just to prove who we are. Um, I think Gen AI is, is part of the promise to make that a much quicker experience. Yeah, um, let me add to that. So I fully agree that there's we're going to see a lot of impact in innovative services and also in the quality of experiences. It's going to be more personalized. Bots will demonstrate a better understanding than ever before. But I also think there is the potential for huge operational efficiency increase, right? Uh, many people have seen or read through the KPIs that Klarna, for example, published together with OpenAIs. They claim that uh, a an, an Gen AI powered bot does the equivalent work of, I think, 700 agents, right? And whether that's 
exactly true or not doesn't matter, but the impact on efficiency is going to be huge and the impact on the whole contact center and BPO ecosystem is also massive. And as I said earlier, we're just very beginning in the very beginning of this revolution and we're going to see much more initiatives being driven by increasing operational efficiency than ever before. Excellent. Very good um, points. These are some exciting opportunities. And while you said they are in the future, they are realistic and they do apply across industries, all verticals. So let's talk about some use cases. What are some real world use cases, either planned or in development? Sebastian, let's start with you and go Alan and Sheila after that. Okay. So if we look at today's application, what, you know, when we uh, speak to clients and prospects, what they implement right now is a lot of knowledge retrieval because Gen AI for the first time has the potential to automatically go through a huge amount of unstructured data and extract meaningful and correct answers from that data. So that is what everybody ever dreamed of, you know, uploading a bunch of PDFs or Excel files and exposing that knowledge that sits somewhere in those hundreds or thousands of pages to customers or agents directly. You know, that is kind of the next generation of inside engines and search, a conversational experience. Um, a counterpiece to that is a next level of understanding. Uh, LLM enhanced language understanding can make sense of customer utterances uh, that classical NLU couldn't. And what everybody dreaded was, sorry, I didn't understand. Can you rephrase the question, right? And we've we've seen that and read that hundreds of times and chat and voice bots have let down millions of people in the past. LLMs can make that much, much, much better. And this is basically what almost all our clients are rolling out into production right now. So if we look at the, that was the customer facing side, a lot about the customer facing side. There's also the agent facing side, which also includes knowledge retrieval, but it also includes functions like call summarization or other, features that just make the agents more efficient and sometimes it even increases their quality of work because they don't have to go through many laborious repetitive tasks but AI can take that uh, away. Now looking at the future what is in development um, I do think that the next generation of bots will will be configured in a way that they drive the conversation so instead of prescribing how an interaction goes we will give bots goals and instructions how to reach those goals. And we will see bots that figure out the way, finding the right words to optimize towards certain goals, right? So we will give LLM-driven goal, LLM-driven bots much more freedom, degrees of freedom to, to achieve their goals. And that requires a new mindset for the people operating those bots because you have to let go. You know, the bot will eventually say things that you haven't scripted, um, but uh, the potential of better experiences and more efficiency is absolutely great. But this is a bit out in the future. We don't see so many of these bots in the wild, but they're definitely uh, up for something big. Great. Yes, um, I have to say I don't have much more to add on top of what Sebastian <laughs> just said. Um, I, I think what we'll see in the medium term is there are a lot of people that are, you know, are using the gen powered uh, AI agents for agent assist and agent co-pilot. What I think we'll see is that, you know, they're working in the background as part of the conversation. So they're coming up with an expectation They they are actually understanding what the intent of the, the caller is uh, and they're coming up, you know, coming up with the solution. And I think what we'll see is it'll be exactly Exactly the same AI agent that's acting as a co-pilot will then at some point flip in some degree to being a consumer facing one. I don't think people will have to rebuild. I think they'll learn from what they're doing as co-pilots and assistants and they will then start taking over whether it'll be to you know take over when it's out of hours and the human contact center is shut. You can then just hand over to the uh, the AI agent that was acting as the co-pilot or maybe even it'll be a capacity thing you know where there's an unexpected peak load they could start doing it but uh, I think we'll see a lot of internal agent facing becoming uh, consumer facing. So just this weekend, I was watching 60 Minutes, which is a news program here in the United States. And it was a story about AI. And obviously, I paid attention. So in the healthcare industry, there are millions of contact center agents worldwide. And yet the need to provide care is still not met. And so 60 Minutes talked about an AI um, uh, application that is a counseling app. So mental health chatbots powered by artificial intelligence developed as therapy tools. And the one that they were highlighting is called WoeBot, as in woe is me, a pocket therapist. So it's not about how can we get people into the clinic? 
It's how do we get tools out of the clinic and into the hands of the people who need them? You know, if you're not actually by the side of a patient when they're struggling to get out of bed or at two o'clock in the morning when they can't sleep and they're getting panicked, then we're actually leaving clinical value on the table was the point that was being made. So interesting to think about, this is really kind of a brand new kind of use case. When I think about what's next, I, I think we're already seeing the seeds of it happening at several companies. I think it's bots that carry out tasks that you set for them by calling on other software and other people to get things done. So not just creating a list of action items, perhaps at the end of a call, but actually completing action items. Now, yeah. Sebastian, do you have any comments on the, uh, the yeah. sort of task action item completion? Is that something that uh, Cognigy is thinking about and working toward? Yeah, so um, I think there's different aspects to that. So first of all, I would say that probably 80% of our clients use some form of transactional bots. You know, we, we've never really sold a lot of FAQ information retrieval bots, but they were always combined with, you know, getting something done. And that absolutely remains. But today this is still kind of hard coded in a bot in a deterministic way. You know, once a client goes down a transactional branch, the process takes over, everything is scripted and very, very well defined. Um, now it's an absolutely fascinating area of research um, to, to, to create those AI agents, which is the, the industry term that is currently being used, that figure out the next steps on their own. Right. They they understand what needs to be done to solve a certain complex query. And we've seen that recent example. Was it called Devon? Uh, Devon AI uh, that did it for programming. It figures out how to create a GitHub repository, how to upload code, how to modify the code, how to send the code somewhere, and maybe even how to create a press release to launch a product. Right. So these AI agents can accomplish a, a fascinating amount of work in the future. I do think today in the contact center world, the application scope is a bit limited, right? It seems to be much more kind of a, a startup thing, a research thing than a, than, a, than a mass market adoption anytime soon, but it's definitely something that our research team uh, has a lot of eyes on. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things that every customer service interaction must have an outcome. And I think this will mm. now change the whole way we measure success. I think that mm. we will see an awful lot of measuring the outcomes rather than the traditional metrics, you know, like I'm in and that sort of thing. I do agree um, that in the short term, we'll see a rapid adoption, mostly in the form of kind of plugins and add ons. So Gen AI will not kind of replace the existing on prem or cloud contact center infrastructure, but it plugs in and it enhances whatever whatever there is. And there are some kind of low hanging fruits to start with. So the call summarization is a very good example that can add a lot of efficiency, right? The IDNV process, we have a client who saves 90 seconds per call for 20 million calls per year only with IDNV. And that is also LLM supported. Uh, so the, the, the efficiency impact there can be quite huge. Um, but now speaking about measuring that impact, so first of all, I do believe that the traditional contact center KPIs will remain absolutely important. You know, for, for decades, there have been measures created like AHT and NPS and so on that will remain relevant. But what Gen AI and AI in general changes is that because of the availability of full transcripts, what is being said and how is it's being said can now also be analyzed by AI. We can track sentiment. We can use emotion AI to listen to the tonality of how someone says something. We can detect nonverbal cues and in interactions. And all of that is routed through the platforms and sense can be extracted from that from those millions and millions and millions of data points. So that can be used as feedback loop to the human agents to help them provide better experiences. It can help to improve the AI automation to provide better experiences. And on the long run, it can be even used to automatically learn from previous transcripts. What worked best? What strategies work to upsell and cross-sell something in a sales and marketing use case and so on? So I think the biggest impact is that we will all benefit from completely new types of data that were unavailable, unobtainable just a short time ago. Sebastian, would you do me a favor and harken back to the acronym that you used? IDNV, I think? Yes. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, ID identification and verification. Um, ah, okay. We Sorry. use it all the time. So yes. I wasn't sure it was an industry term. Maybe I made <laughs> it up. 
<laughs> ID and B. There's an ampersand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's going to get extended as well. It's going to end up being IDV and I. So it'll be identification, verification, and intent. But no, yeah. it's oh. still, we probably still need to spell it out. <laughs> yes, I mean, um, I think perhaps we sort of reframing the question slightly is why does um, why do companies using traditional contact centre vendors need to start looking at these innovations? And I think it boils down to something we've seen everywhere in the world, and that it's really difficult to get good human agents these days. You can't get enough of them to come and work in the contact centre, particularly after the pandemic. People don't want, they've all found different careers, different ways of working, different lifestyles. And universally, people are saying we need more human agents. But failing that, what we can do is that with the latest sort of LLM powered um, AI agents, they can almost, you know, go and live in the contact centre alongside the humans. They can be managed by the traditional CCAS platform. So they can be managed, whether it's on-prem or whether it's um, in the cloud, you know, they can be managed by Avaya and Genesis. And they can, you know, uh, as Sebastian said, carry out you know, consumer facing um, interactions or they can be in the background working with the with the human agents to make them a bit more efficient and, and to make their lives a bit easier. And so um, I think that we'll we'll see a lot of that and that will help a lot of companies get into the cloud as well because this workforce will be in the cloud. Uh, but of course, you will also then need a way of managing that workforce. And the great thing is, because um, as Sheila so eloquently put it, we are working really closely with um, the contact centre vendors. You have the contact centre vendors to manage the humans providing customer service, fully integrated with this new platform that's managing the, the AI agents also within the same interactions, which then means you have a seamless customer experience. None of this sort of disparate systems. Excellent. So what's next? What does this mean for companies moving forward, short term or longer term? Let's go with Alan, Sebastian, and then Sheila, you get the final word. All oh, right. OK, <laughs> well, the, the risk of repeating myself, I think in the, the short to medium term, we will see an expansion of use cases. Uh, we will see, you know, sales and marketing. Uh, we will see something I've always wanted to do as a marketer. We will see conversational marketing. So we'll have the ability that somebody could um, uh, be a, a user of a shampoo and on the back of the shampoo bottle is a QR code and you'll be able to scan the QR code and start a WhatsApp conversation directly with the brand. And you can say, I bought this shampoo and it made my hair go frizzy. And the AI on the other end of the conversation will know which brand of shampoo it is because obviously the QR code will identify it. They will know what your intent is and it'll then be able to have a conversation with you about your hair type and what you need to do to stop your hair going frizzy and maybe make a product recommendation. And once that conversation has been opened, it remains persistent until the consumer decides to close it. It's like having a WhatsApp conversation with one of your friends. They never go away, they never finish. And so, you know, as long as all the opt-ins and consents are there, we'll see, um, you know, these fast moving consumer goods companies being able to have a one-to-one -one personalized relationship with the consumers of their product. They've never been able to do this in the past. You know, all of the relationship between consumer and product was done through the retailer. You know, it would be the drugstore where they went and bought the, the shampoo. They would never have had that communication with, um, with, with the, the FMCG manufacturer. I know all of them have put telephone numbers on their products, but I bet nobody ever calls those numbers. But if you could have you know, a really reliable and informative conversation, and it could be used for upsells. You know, once you know the person has frizzy hair, you can sell them conditioner for frizzy hair, send them a, a voucher that they can take to their retail outlet and go and use it. So I think, yeah, short to medium term, we'll really see some exciting uh, revelations in both the sales side and the marketing side of things. And I think long term, it'll be the norm that you expect to talk to uh, an AI agent or an automation when you call a customer service. I think you will expect to see that. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever get to the point, and we were talking about this this morning with much allowance to you, of actually having somebody asking the uh, the agent on the other end, are you a human? And then saying, can I speak to a bot? Or shouting bot, bot, instead of live agent. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but you never know, we might. <laughs> yeah, let me continue. Um, so I think, Ellen, in your introduction, uh, you said something, it was you know, the most fun past year in your life, or the most fun yes. uh, 12 months. Um, and uh, well, while I would certainly agree, I also think it was the probably the, the, the most fast-paced 12 months of my career. A AI has turned everything upside down. Uh, we see kind of a, a massive inflation of content everywhere. Everything feels faster, happening faster, and uh, we're still only at the beginning of that AI revolution. You know, a lot of people speak of, 
what sometimes uh, dubbed Gates Law. So people overestimate what they can achieve in a year and they underestimate what they can achieve in 10 years. And this is the phase that I feel we're in right now in the AI contact center space. There is some inertia in industry as large as the contact center industry. But in 10 years, it's going to be completely upside down. Um, for a long time, we've spoken about AI first and AI native. I don't think that has really happened for most organizations, but it will definitely happen in the course of the next years. But if we zoom out a little bit, what else will change? Um, I firmly believe in the emergence of truly personal assistance, right? So, Alan, you spoke about uh, the idea that someone could call a company um, or just text them on WhatsApp and they would respond with a one-on-one -on -one relationship. What could also happen is that you tell your Ellen assistant bot, go fix that for me, you know, make me that dentist appointment, uh, find me that cheapest flight to X and Y, complain to company X and Y about the frizzy hair and get me a discount, you know. And what that means is an exponential increase of the call volume because suddenly it is AIs calling AIs with language becoming the new interface of machine to machine communication. Now that may seem a little bit far fetched, but if you think it through with decreasing marginal costs per call, uh, outbound calls and inbound calls, we'll see a lot of robots talking to each other and managing things on behalf of their human owners or human managers. So that's gonna be a really interesting future. Future not definitely not happening in the next 12 months or maybe not happening in the, 12, in the next 12 months, but I'm very sure at the largest consumer companies in the world, Apple, Facebook, Google, that's what's being worked on, right? And that will impact uh, our business more than anything that has ever happened before. So there's a uh, oft used phrase in financial markets that you can't time the market. Right? It'd be great if we could all buy low and sell high, but even the most successful Wall Street arbitrageurs make mistakes and lose big from time to time. I believe the same is true when we're trying to time deployment of innovation into your business. Yes, technology is going to continue to change, but waiting for change to stop is like trying to time the market, and it's an impossible task. And as, as Sebastian has, has talked about, the pace of innovation is what has been so extraordinary for the last 18 months or so. So my advice to companies is to start. Start small with a proof of concept or a trial in a small part of your business or a small use case and evaluate the outcome of Gen AI for your business. I think you're going to find that adding automation, a chat bot, a voice bot, can increase your interaction automation rate dramatically, right? I remember when we first introduced IVRs and if people were able to um, handle 5% of their interactions with an IVR, that was great. That was 5% that mm. didn't require a live agent, right? So if now we can take that 5% to 20% to 30%, I mean, these kinds of use cases are already, you know, uh, happening out there in the market and Cognigy companies that are getting co Cognigy customers that are getting these kinds of results. So as, as Sebastian said, okay, it hasn't all happened in a year, but you're not going to be getting the fruits of what is happening unless you get started. How yeah. do you think Absolutely. will that impact the role of the humans in the contact center? So will their jobs be easier or more demanding? Will there be more or less agents? What do you think? So uh, Sheila's opinion, right, is if we think there are about 15 million agents in the world, um, I think in five years, we will have less live agents, right? I don't think it's going to be a dramatic change, though. I think it's going to be on the order of 10%. But that's still a million and a half agents less in the workforce, okay? And what are their jobs going to be like? I think their jobs are gonna be easier. I think we're actually going to make contact center jobs more attractive because they, you know, one of the, the, the struggles with contact center agents is I can't answer the question. I don't know the answer. I'm not empowered to give an answer. And these are, are issues that can be addressed 
with Gen AI and other technologies that are just coming out now. So I do agree we'll have fewer agents, but I don't think we're going to be replacing, you know, 15 million agents, even in your 10 year frame. Fantastic. So we're at time. I want to thank you. Very, very exciting and insightful conversation. Sheila Allen, Sebastian, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us today. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.